Hi everyone, in this video I'm going to introduce um, inverse problems, um, their formulation, uh, as well as uh, go over well-posedness, which is uh, basically the main issue with, with inverse problems that needs to be addressed. Um, and this series of notes um, slash videos will largely follow some notes by um, a professor at UT Austin, Omar Gattas. Um, as well as I'll take a few examples from Andreas Finkner, who's a professor in uh, Switzerland. He also has a good set of notes. Um, and then finally, um, I'll also take from a famous book called Inverse Theory by Albert Tarantola. Um, so if you guys want to follow along, you can find um, these references and, and uh, see these things in, in more detail. But like I said, I'll mostly follow these, these notes by Omar Gattas. Um, so what is an inverse problem? Um, an inverse problem is, uh, this boxed equation and in this boxed equation, uh, F of M is, is some operator and we're solving for M. So that's why it's called an inverse problem. Um, because if we have the inverse of this operator f, we just apply it to both sides, and from that we recover m. So m is our model parameter here, and typically f is a, a PDE in the context of, of this series, but really it can be any model. It could even be a neural network. Uh, you don't necessarily even have to understand what it is. It's just some operator, but in our context it's going to be a PDE, um, where things are relatively easy to interpret. So M uh, in the PDE, you can imagine a temperature field, um, diffusivity field, an initial condition, a boundary condition, a dipole moment, any sort of physically relevant uh, field. Um, F of this uh, operator F is what we'll call the forward model um, or parameter to observable map. And just note that this is not the same as the forward problem. Okay, so um, that is because F doesn't, isn't necessarily solving the PDE. So for example, um, you typically have this workflow. Uh, your parameter maps to some R of U M. So for example, if I had some differential operator L of U M equals data, then my residual is just L of U M minus D. And we set that to zero. So we typically have that form. Then from there, we can solve this equation for the field U. Sorry, I'll zoom in a bit. I'll actually go down. I didn't give myself enough space here. So this is what we call, I'll zoom in here just to, so this right here is what we call the forward problem, which is not the same. So if I ever say forward model, um, I'm referring to more than just this step B. Just, just to be careful with notation here. Sorry about zooming in and out. So here and then from C, this is the main point. This is the main difference between the forward problem. So A is really just algebraic, but then this is um, our main difference here. At the very end, um, we have an observation operator. So for example, if um, if let, let's consider this whole workflow. So I take M and I map to M times a very simple uh, PDE here, an ODE. So I uh, map this to some. vectorized equation here. So I have this residual. 
I can actually solve this system. This gives me some vector u. But then at the very end, so that's solving the forward, sorry, I went out of the scope of uh, the visual field here. I can solve this equation in, in uh, theory by, by just solving that system. But I don't observe necessarily the whole field. So for example, in certain experiments, you can only uh, see things on the boundary of the domain. In this case, you have a 1D domain, and so that boundary is just two numbers. And that's the main difference between the forward model and the forward problem, uh, is that the forward problem is really solving the full problem, which you, you have to do. In the context, you have to solve the PDE, but your observations uh, might be sparser than, those, than, than just that. And then finally, this right-hand side, this d plus eta, is what we actually experimentally observe, right? So the reason why I write this as d plus eta is because typically you don't have perfect um, signal. So eta is your noise, and d is what we'll just denote as our quote-unquote true data. Of course, you can't in practice perfectly delineate these usually, um, so for now, just think of them as, you know, if we could, in theory, fully extract them, um, they're there. So, um, uh, so yeah, so to keep in mind, we don't have perfect observations. And those lack of perfect, perfect observations are what make well-posedness important here. So, um, so let's, let's consider well-posedness. So I'm just going to say, I'm going to call D uh, our right-hand side. And I'm just going to rewrite our problem. Given noisy D, so really I could call this D plus eta, but again, we can't delineate it in practice. So I'm just going to call it D. Just keep in mind that it's noisy. Our job is to find m such that f of m approximately equals d. And what I mean by this approximately is that the difference of the forward model of m minus d is really, um, you know, within, is either, uh, is is less than or equal to say the, the order of the noise is, is the noise or within the order of the noise since you don't typically know those exactly. So you have to have some condition. Uh, the point is it depends on your experiment. You don't know how precise you are necessarily. So I'm gonna denote this as a map phi of D equals M if and only if F of M approximately equals D again in this sense. So typically we have existence. So well-posedness has three conditions. Uh, we typically have uniqueness, but I put a minus here because uh, sometimes you might not even have uniqueness. But for the most part, we can say, okay, well, we have existence and uniqueness, but typically, um, we don't have stability. And stability can be formulated as phi is continuous for every or at every input d. And so that is to say, for every epsilon positive, there's a theta greater than zero, such that delta D less than theta implies that the norm of phi of D plus delta D minus phi of D is less than epsilon. So typically, 
3 does not hold. And this is the main complication. with inverse problems. So, uh, so this continuity basically says we typically violate this condition. So this says small perturbations in the input space, where the input is, this, is the data that we input. Small perturbations in the uh, input lead to small perturbations in the output. But the negation of this is true. In, in typically. So that usually means there are small perturbations of the input such that the there is a significantly large perturbation in the output. Um, and in the next video, I'll show you um, an example where this bound here on the right, even for a 1D problem, can get exponentially bad. Um, so they're extremely ill-posed. And this is, again, the main complication with inverse problems that we have to work around. Um, so hopefully this gives you a general sense here. Uh, so yeah, so just one more, um, thing I'd like to point out. These perturbations are unavoidable because we don't have perfect observations. Really our data is the true data plus some perturbation of the noise. So this sensitivity makes, um, Unless you develop a perfect instrument with an experiment, which will never happen, um, you, you have to deal with this in theory. So um, hopefully this gives you guys some good background um, and motivates the problem well. And I hope to see you in the next video where we uh, show an actual example of this.